Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining me today in the locker room. I'm Alan Locker. Today, I have three talented women who are here to discuss their brilliant and powerful film, Angie Lost Girls, directed by Julia Verdon, starring Olivia Diabo in a powerhouse performance and produced by Katie McLean. Olivia Diabo is a mother, actress, singer, and songwriter who plays Haley, the mother of 16-year-old Angie in the film. She's well known to television audiences for playing Karen Arnold on The Wonder Years and has appeared in numerous other roles, including Conan the Destroyer, Point of No Return, Law and Order, Criminal Intent, The Single Guy, to name a small few. In animation, she voices an array of characters in Mortal Kombat, Defenders of the Realm, Batman Beyond, Justice League, Star Wars, The Clone Wars, Green Lantern, First Flight, Ultimate Avengers, and so much more. Katie McLean is a two-time Emmy-nominated director and film producer. Her directing and producing credits include the documentary Seeing is Believing, Women Direct, the feature film How We Got Away With It, directed by John Lindstrom, the film play Paint Made Flesh, Butterflies, which was the winner of Best Short Film and Best Actress in a Short Film, The World of Albert Fun, winner Best Comedy and Drama Short, and the web series Split, starring Olympia Dukakis. In 2017 and 2018, she was consecutively honored with a daytime drama web series Emmy nominations for her work on Venice the Series. McLean was honored to receive the 2017 International Matrix Award from the Association of Women in Com Communications for her work in support of female directors. Daytime fans will recognize Katie for her Emmy Award-winning roles as Dixie on All My Children and Rosanna on a, As the World Turns. And she just finished up a short stint playing Jennifer Horton on Days of Our Lives. Julia Verdon is a director, producer, and writer and founder of Artists for Change. She has produced 34 films to date, including Merchant of Venice starring Al Pacino and Jeremy Irons, Stander starring Thomas Jane and Deborah Unger, and Two Jack starring Sienna Miller, Danny Houston, and Jack Houston. Julia made her directing debut with the award-winning short film Lost Girls, which was a precursor to this feature film, uh, feature-length version of the film. In addition to directing, she also co-wrote and produced both films. She is passionate about the power of film to shed light on important social and humanitarian issues. The film received awards for Best Drama and Best Ensemble Cast from the Los Angeles Inter Independent Film Festival, Award of Excellence from Indie Fest, and Best Social Impact from the Culver City Film Festival. The movie, Angie Lost Girls, is about a 16-year-old Angie Morgan, played by Jane Widop, who is abducted into sex a sex trafficking ring, and her blissfully suburban life is upended by a living nightmare. She faces unspeakable horrors at the hands of her traffickers, finding solace in only her victims, in her fellow victims, and what little faith she has left. When she finally manages to escape months later, her family struggles to reconnect with a different Angie than they remember, a woman thrust out of childhood and traumatized beyond recognition. Angie's assigned caseworker, a former trafficking victim, recognizes Angie's survivor guilt about the girls left behind and recognizes that she needs to get her self-esteem back. She encourages Angie to speak out and help shut down the ring for good. But the threat of reabduction and violence against her loved ones is constantly looming. Despite her suffocating fear, will Angie stop running and face her past head on? Or are she and the girls left behind lost completely? Acts about human trafficking. It is the number two largest criminal enterprise in the world generating 150.2 billion. There are an estimated 100,000 known child victims of sex trafficking in the US and 300,000 American children are at risk. The average age a child enters into the commercial sex trade is 11 to 13 years old. It is my pleasure to welcome to the locker room, Olivia Diabo, Katie McLean, and Julia Verdon. Just one second. Julia, Katie, and Olivia. Hi. Hi, everybody. Hello. Thank you so much for being here. That that was a mouthful, but I think so important. <laughs> <I was gonna laughs> <say>. Wow. <laughs> so important. What a champion you are for getting that all out. I don't even well, think Well, I hope all breath. of the facts were correct. Um Julia, let's let's go back to the short documentary that Angie 
you know, is is um, based on. How did that come to be the short documentary and and this, you know, you taking up this issue? So, um, yeah, well, first of all, Adam, thank you so much for having um, us on your show. And thank you so much for being interested in this issue and wanting to support us getting the word out. It is always really great to see like men taking a stance against trafficking too. So thank you for that. You're, you're, so, you're very welcome. It's, it, it, the, the movie leaves, leaves a, an impact on you and, you know, even um, enlightened me to, to things I didn't really understand, I think, about it. So. And, and, and that's actually, that, that's exactly what inspired me to, to, to make these films because I was volunteering at a children's shelter for runaway kids down in the valley. And whilst I was doing kind of, you know, cold reading workshops with them, and whilst I was there, I noticed that a lot of these very young girls seemed very traumatized. And it was clear that something had happened to them. And my gut instinct told me they'd been through some type of abuse. And as I started talking to the staff and the other volunteers there, I started learning these horrific stories some of these kids had been through. And a lot of them had been trafficked. And the stories really just shocked me to the, the, the core and seeing these this level of trauma on these really young 14, 15 year old girls. I just thought, you know, I can't believe this is happening here in LA. There's gotta be something that we can do about it. So I started researching, having a kind of inquiring mind. And I, I started talking to detectives, other NGOs, and I realized that what a prolific problem it was. And I had no idea it was so prolific and going on right here in our doorsteps. And I just thought, I've got to do something about this. And for me, film is the way to do it. And I've always been a great believer that people tend to go and see documentaries once they're already interested in a subject. Mm -hmm. But a narrative film can have the power to get them interested through like emotionally engaging with the characters and their stories. So the first film um, I did was Lost Girls. It was actually a, na a short narrative feature. It was a 25 minute short. And it, it, it's, it's different from Lost Girls. It's about a young girl who recruits another young girl. And it's also about the cycle of abuse so when I, and I, I, we had a lot of success with that. We had a lot of organizations use it for awareness and outreach and education. Uh, we won a lot of awards with the film. We had a lot of organizations use it for their gala fundraisers. And I saw that we could do like a lot more. And I felt there were other aspects to the issue that could be tra tackled. So when I came up um, about doing the feature film, I, again did a lot of research and I talked with a lot of people working in the field about what story would be the most helpful and what areas would be the most helpful to touch on in, in terms of making a film that would help raise awareness. And um, obviously the trafficking aspect and the different ways traffickers <coughs> traffic the victims. So in the film, we, we don't just see Angie's story. We obviously focus on Angie's story, but we also learn how mm -hmm. a number of the other girls in the house also get trafficked all through different means. And then a big issue and where a lot of the organizations need support is in providing aftercare for victims because once you have been through that terrible type of experience, if you're lucky enough to escape, and unfortunately many of them don't, you need an enormous amount of therapy, aftercare, support. And these family, and you know, a lot of these lower income families or these young girls who don't have any families don't, you know, don't have the means to get that for themselves. So a lot of it is provided by NGOs. And we so we need people donating to these NGOs and helping to support them so they can continue to provide those services. Wow. Um, I, I mean, I can only imagine the, the PTSD, you know, that they, they all, if, if, like you said, the, the word uh, lucky to get out, but if they are that lucky to get out, the PTSD, um, 
just must be, uh, you know, something that, you know, I mean, that's why mental health, you know, is so important and people need to talk about that. Olivia, did you know Julia before the, before being cast in this movie? Never met her in my life. <laughs> <laughs> so what, no, and, 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 and you're a mom. What yes. did you think when you first read this script? I was, um, I was passionate about the pod project having been such good comrades with Julia. We've known each other for, for, for she's like my soul sister. Oh, and, I love it. Um, so through our relationship uh, and our friendship uh, and her passion, quite frankly, I became aware and, and motivated to sort of follow her plight, uh, really, so to speak. Uh, and when this script came along, it seemed like the perfect opportunity to um, get on board with her and really help her support her vision. Um, I very much immediately was uh, just taken with the character of Haley, who's sort of a tightly wound type A personality, mom who's a career mom for the most part, who uh, her and her husband are really, you know, we just moved with our two girls. And so we're doing our best to kind of bring in as much money as we can to support our family but mm -hmm. um so I, I liked that it was a middle class family i thought that was an interesting take on this kind of subject matter i think all the more reason why um it, it it's it's appealing to so many different um you know people you know because this kind of thing can happen to any family uh single with single mothers who are you know working that took us off to try and bring home the bacon and you know there's only so much you can do obviously when you're juggling to try and provide for your family so you know things fall through the cracks and i think in this particular circumstance with the film and and the characters of the parents we um aren't able to show up as much as we would like to um you know, for, for our, our, our daughters. And when our eldest daughter goes missing, Angie, it's, you know, it's, it's just a kind of, a, we get in, we get caught up in this, um, this whirlwind of, of emotion. And then, then the rehabilitation aspect of what you guys were just talking about is really, um, I think where you see parentally how the mother and the father show their true colors and how they try not only rehabilitate Angie back into the family, but bring try and bring the family back together because we're all really trying to sort of find a common correct ground together again. It, 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 interesting that I said PTSD earlier. It's not just for Angie; it is for the entire. You know, the, the mother in, in the movie. It's mother, mother, father, and Angie's younger sister. I, I'm sure it takes. Uh, an enormous amount of strength and and love in a family to to help people through that. Katie, you, um, if I'm not mistaken, you were introduced to the short. Is that how you met Julia? Oh, that's right. Um, I met Julia through my husband, John Lindstrom, who knew Julia from way back. And uh, we got an invitation to come to a screening of the short film. And I was so impressed with Julia, her strength, uh, her courage, her her dedication to this topic, um, and the the craft of the film of the short film, it was so well done, and uh, she had taken it from uh, a, a beautiful narrative also out to become this kind of tip of the spear for the cause, you know, as she was saying before, using story to really motivate people to become aware of what's going on and to do something about it, which I was just so impressed by. And so I just wanted to do whatever I could to, uh, to help uh, make, make the film. It's great. Um, what were all of you most surprised to learn about trafficking? Like what, what was the most shocking thing, you know, in doing research for this film for each of you there must have been something that just. Well, I, I would. Oh, Julia, please go ahead. Yes, I think. I think <laughs> for me, for me, um, it was the sheer, sheer numbers of of children that that go missing and are trafficked in LA, and the fact that it's it's a billion dollar industry, 
And and so, you know, it's no surprise that those numbers of, of missing children are so high. And I, I honestly had no idea that it was uh, it, it was happening here in America on this scale. And I think the average pe person's perception is trafficking is something that goes on over there, somewhere else, overseas, but not mm -hmm. kind of here in America. And and when people have, have seen the film, they've often been really surprised to like to, to, to learn that. The other thing that shocked me was that the average age of, of um, children traffic is 12 years old. And the idea of a 12 year old child being trafficked, it just, oh, I, I, it just like kind of curdles my blood and makes me feel a little sick. And also the, 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 the manipulations and, and the, 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 how clever these traffickers are in knowing how to spot their victims and spot the vulnerable children and manipulate them to kind of like come with them. And they're very sophisticated, very sophisticated um, operations. That was very, and I won't speak about it too much, but that was very interesting in the movie. You know, you know, people will watch the movie and, and, and see how Angie is, um, brought into it and, and I found that you know I, it early on I wasn't sure that person's role and then you know you learn through the movie you know you know why that person was um doing that to Angie and and inviting her into that horrible horrible world Katie or Olivia for you the most surprising you know well, I think Olivia please sorry uh you know i think julia covered it beautifully you know i i think like you like you guys both mentioned it in the film i think that audiences will be very surprised um and somewhat shocked by how how angie is lured in and and, and it's just interesting in the film and shocking to me as a mother and a parent and a human being that uh, again, how sophisticated they are, how it in the film came across through a romantic resource, you know, uh, um, the, 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 it, by this, you know, beautiful young man who's yeah. about Angie's age and, and the vulnerability of her opening up her heart to him with her music, you know, it's from such a pure place and what ignites her to go eventually to get taken in by the traffickers is that she thinks she has an opportunity as, as a young music artist to which she's sort of somewhat self-deprecating about herself in that regard anyway but yet he encourages her and he says no you're really good and so uh it, it's even the more it suspenseful it, it the stakes are almost even higher do you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. that it happens through that in through that um route yeah through the vulnerability for sure yeah. Yeah, because she really doesn't know, as it's portrayed in the film, you know, Angie really doesn't know until the very last minute what's actually happening to her. I mean, she's actually about to, you know, playing a song and the man's there and she thinks it's a record executive right. and, he's, and he's got a whole other thing in <laughs> hand. And so it's really, as an Awful. audience, as a viewer, you're just sort of watching it and can kind of cringing, going, "Oh no," because we know what's coming next, but she doesn't. So I think Julia really portrayed that in a in a very visceral way, in a very real way, and then that and that that is what happens because I think what Julia and Caddy accomplished producerially and directorially is really hard, true facts. I mean, this is these this, these weren't things that were made up. There was a lot of research that went in by these ladies to to really um, keep it as as truthful as possible. So, well, Katie, one second, one yes, second. But in just for Julia, in in that are because you said you spoke to so many young women. Um, are there parts of all of their stories that you wove into this kind of? Um, yeah, I did. I had the, the former head, Lieutenant Andre Dawson, who was the former head of the child trafficking unit in LA, was a consultant for me on the project. So I had extensive talks with him and he told me a lot of different stories. 
I also talked to some survivors. I talked to someone who'd had her, her um, had two survivor consultants on the project. And I also talked to a mother whose child was trafficked. Um, she didn't want her name to be mentioned, so she wanted to keep it very private. But just, that helped me get the emotional mm. you know, thing that she went through. And I also talked with a lot of with a lot of in NGOs, with, you know, in particular Kim Biddle at Saving Innocence, and they're a wonderful organisation who who specifically deal in child trafficking. And and Tina Paulson, who's also uh, at the Ark of Recovery for Children, who's also amazing. So I learned of a lot of stories from them, and it wasn't one person's story. I amalgamated different stories together. To, to find a kind of story that worked. And, and also the actuality is the majority of, of teenagers that are trafficked usually come from the lower income and lower socioeconomical backgrounds. A lot of foster youth get trafficked. Gotcha. But it does happen in the middle classes. But I, I wanted to, to make a film that would get some attention and would get people that could really help make a difference behind it. And I'd seen other friends, you know, make beautiful films about kind of foster youth. And it, it, it was it's tragic, but those films just disappeared and they didn't get any traction behind it. And particularly, we need to get, as a society, more mentorship going for those kids that don't have present parents, those kids in the foster care um, system. Katie actually made a beautiful short film that won a number of awards um, about the you know foster youth and some of the traumas that they go in front of and and I, I think that's something that we can all do to step up with to kind of see how we can support foster youth coming out when they transition out from their foster homes and go into the world so they don't get preyed on or exploited right. and also the ones they're in you know the foster homes so they don't get preyed on and exploited. Right. Katie, uh, talk about both things, what you were most surprised, and then talk about the short film about the foster care system. Well, first of all, I also want to, uh, well, I will. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I, I knew that Olivia, no. I wanted to con connect that. So. No, no, it's all good. It's all good. Um, I, I really, all uh, efforts for outreach, for um, uh, uh, research, I mean, this is all Julia, this is all her efforts. You know, I was basically, what needs to be done next? Give me the shovel, I I'll go dig it up. <laughs> okay, you know, and, and, and just trying to be useful. And, uh, but really it, it all praise goes to her for this film. And so I just wanna make sure that is super clear because this is her passion and, and I was just here to help. Um, the, the thing that was, I guess there were many aspects that surprised me. One, I just remember being at that short film screening and the women, the mothers in the room, really being so devastatingly shocked, so traumatized that, the, that this could possibly happen to one of their children. They didn't know. And they had teenage girls and they didn't know that this is out there and rampant. I mean, growing up in show business in Los Angeles as a child, I was aware that there were darker forces that you had to be extremely careful of. Look over your shoulder. Oh yeah, I mean, or even in the rooms that you would walk into, things could be right. very dicey and dangerous and very quickly. And so, uh, but but the mothers were not aware of, of the, of the and what J Julia did with this powerful narrative. And I think what's so important about the film is that it rocks you to your core uh, about what is actually happening. The, the police know about it, these organizations know about it, but your sort of average everyday, you know, mom and dad aren't aware of what could happen to their children in a moment. It's such a huge industry. And so the film is so beautifully crafted to bring in the family, to have people allow the family to talk about this subject and to help these kids become aware as well as the organizations. And, uh, and I do hope the film is used 
more in, for the by the foster organizations to help the foster kids be aware because they're also naive to the forces out there that are preying upon their innocence um, or that are looking to prey upon their innocence. Do we know as a factual thing that foster kids are more likely to end up in this? Yes, we do. Having talked to a lot of the organizations, it's because a, a, a lot of these kids, and this is where the, the, the traffickers succeed in luring them, that they're, they're looking for love in all the wrong places. And they're looking for a father figure, a kind of parental type of figure. And so when, when somebody suddenly appears in their life and was is interested in them and um, you know talk, taking an interest, giving them gifts, it makes them feel cared about. And it's, it's, that's what's so tragic, is that's what these beautiful children just want love and care. And so if we could find another way of giving them that love and care, like getting you know, more mentorship going, you know, people taking on these foster, the foster being acting as foster parents um, or acting as some type of mentors for these kids. You know, I think I think that's how we can help them by giving them a kind of like safe love and safe people taking an interest in them, so they're less likely to to fall into these traps. Wow! At at the end of the movie, you have that slate up. Is that uh, the the you can text help? Is that still an actual number? Yes, that is. So. If you or someone you know may be endangered by a trafficking situation, text HELP to be free, 233733. Share this with anybody who you might be in that situation or you're worried about. And another thing I would say, Alan, is, is if people, you know, one thing that we can all do as, as, yeah. a, as a group, yeah. is just all keep our eyes open. So when we see the signs of something that doesn't look right, report it. The police are always happy to hear from you. I would definitely say nobody should try and jump in and solve the situation themselves because sometimes these people can be armed or dangerous. But if you see something that doesn't look right, call 911 and report it. Crazy. It, it, it's really... Um, and, and people can go to... It, I know this is a lot, but artistsforchange.org, film projects backslash Lost Girls Angie, and you can find out uh, where to watch the film. So please check that out. Um, I, I, um, where did you find Angie? We auditioned uh, a lot of girls. Katie actually found us this wonderful casting director called um, Mia Kusumano. And I must say, Katie was a wonderful producer. She did a lot more than, than just shoveling. <laughs> just shoveling? <laughs> she, 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 you know, that's, that's one of the things that you need, you know. It's, it's unique. When I met Katie, I was immediately inspired by her kind of like passion and her commitment to making this happen. And so she she found this wonderful casting director, Mia Kusumano, and we auditioned like a huge number of young girls. And I think for all of us, when we saw Jane's audition, we we immediately knew this was our this was our girl. She was like a young Jodie Foster, wasn't she, Katie, with those mm -hmm. eyes and and just her rawness and realness. What a roller coaster for a young woman to play a character like that. Um she had so much courage. I mean, she had no fear. She was absolutely committed to this as if it was a calling. Um, she was representing all the women and girls that had been hurt and she was fully ready to go through it completely. Take after take after take. It was not easy. I couldn't be on set sometimes. I don't know how, I mean, again, Julia, you're a force. Uh, to be able to <laughs> to make this film, I, it was so hard for me, uh, and and the courage of of Jane and the other girls. I mean, I would come in with blankets, you know, and be like, "Do you need a blanket? Do you need, <laughs> do you need a coffee? Like, what can I do? You know, just anything to to help soothe." But they had so much courage, and they were completely committed and inspired by Julia's direction to be able to to give those performances. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Olivia, 
Olivia, what was it like working with her, with Jane? Absolutely incredible. I, I just was gobsmacked the entire time. Yeah. Uh, I th She made my job a lot easier <laughs> because, you know, I mean, the big, the, the you know, acting 101 is, is, you know, you learn to listen and you, you, you know, you think you know what you're going to do with a scene and you learn your lines and you, you have your highlighted beats and then you get on set and you find somebody like this amazing young actress um, and it just sort of reignited my whole uh, perception of, 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 of what, what acting was. She was just on a whole other level, just a, a whole other barometer. Um, so I was I was just honored to 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 be in in the space with her and uh, to to I immediately felt protective of her. You know, she was like a trapped animal to watch. It was she, I don't know oh. anything we learn about. Oh, you're a you're she's like a cat or maybe you're a you know the squirrel or you you know you work on some sort of animal, right? And and for me, she was just she just like Julia and Caddy were saying, she just had these she has these amazing eyes. And and during the rehabilitation part of the film, she was just remind you just want to hug her the whole time, you know. Like um, Caddy was saying, you know, do you need a blanket? I think everybody felt very protective of her because she was channeling something. Other, it was just it, it was from like I said a whole other level. It was there was no acting in her performance. She was this girl Andrew, going through yeah. beat by beat the experience, the journey, which is what makes the film so powerful. Is um, you know I think of I, I don't know how old Jane is. What is she an adult? Because like being on set and going through that. Yeah, I mean that's. I mean, that's a we lot for any actress at any age. But if she's, Certainly. you know, a teenager, you know, yeah. that, it, you know, it, it, it's a lot, you know, yeah. like, yeah. Katie, you said you want you, you wanted to wrap her up. I mean, what? All she, the girls. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All the girls. I was yeah. like, <laughs> like a little chicken. I was going to sit on them. <laughs> uh, um, you're very right, Alan. That that was something we really had to consider on set. We, you know, we were very careful to keep a very loving atmosphere. So, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of the girls had their parents with them. Jane had her mother there um, throughout the shoot. And, um, it, you know, after each take, you know, there would be kind of like hugs and making you sure. You need to like ready. shake that out. Oh, yeah. yeah. Get it off. <laughs> yeah. Get and it I'm off here, you. Here, Get here, it here. off you. Yeah, and the fashion was very interesting for all of us. I, I, I remember talking The what, what was interesting? Pardon? I didn't hear what, what was interesting. What part? The shaking off part? Yeah, just just the just the decompression. The de the gotcha. Uh, yeah, I would say Randall, who plays so wonderfully uh, Jane's father in it, and, and my husband. You know, he'd look at me sometimes, and he'd be like, "What are they? What are they doing to us? What, <laughs> what, what's going on? Like, we got to do this again. We got to do it." Does Randall thing. have children too? <laughs> yes, he has a daughter. Uh, but uh, I mean, you know, we would. You know, it was it, we shot the film around Christmas time, and it was the end of the year, and so that's just a sort of a time I think to kind of you go more inward and to think about what you what the years brought about, and 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 we were working, we were doing something really important, and so the commitment I think was uh, everybody was there just just committing with a lot of emotion, and so we all had to once leaving the set. I would go home and do the dishes. I would play the piano because I'm a musician just to get the emotion out, take a walk, do something to just to kind of, you know, your own rehabilitation back home to shake it off and, and just have a little bit of downtime because we were, we were at this certain level of anxiolytic emotion throughout the whole thing. You know, that's where you've got to go as an actor, but, uh, that's why the film's so powerful, you know. Well, well, it is, and it is, you know, educational. Like I, I 
didn't know a lot on the subject. You know, I am a fan of Ricky Martin and I know I have heard him talk about this issue many times, but in the movie, um, seeing the, um, what they're specifically sold for was surprising to me. Like I, you know, I, I don't know in my mind if I thought, um, people who are trafficked, you know, are sort of sold to one person, you know, I, in the movie, you know, it was just man after man after man having sex with these young girls. And that part was really, um, you know, traumatizing, you know, to watch and to, to realize, cause I, I didn't, and I might not be alone. I may, you know, I don't know how many really understand. And that's why I think what you're doing is so important. Can you, Julia, talk about how you're using this? At, I know you spoke a little about it earlier about the educational sure. aspect. And and that's one thing, you know, obviously, because we had these, you know, we, this, the, the, these were like challenging roles for young actors to do. We, as I said, we had to have a lot of hugging on set and constantly make sure that everybody felt very safe. And we did have managed an incredibly loving atmosphere. And there was actually a lot of laughter kind of between the takes and stuff because we all needed that and we all had to kind of you know, consciously have that to like let up after. But when, when in making this film, I, I wanted my, I, I have to think about who I wanted the audience to be for the film. And I wanted this film to be made, watched by teenagers, families, mothers, parents, and teachers. So I very carefully decided to make a film without any nudity in it. So even though it's a film about trafficking, mm -hmm. there's, no, there's no nudity in it. There's nothing over gratuitous. When we do see the, the one scene with Jane, I think it's the scene that, that you're talking about that you found very disturbing. It's very powerful because we're focused on her face. We're mm -hmm. not actually seeing her getting raped. We're focused right. on her face with this reaction to this mm -hmm. guy that has come into 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 the room, and and I I kept that one little piece in because I think thought, felt we needed that one kind of slightly shocking scene to really bring the point home as to how horrendous this is. Well, um, it demonstrated for me what really happens in that situation, you know, what they're being sold for. And I think for many people who might not fully understand the scope of it, I think that was really powerful and a smart way to do it. Yeah, and if, if you think about it, a lot of the other scenes, like when she's sent into the room with a, with a, with a, with a number of guys, we don't actually see anything. We just hear the, mm -hmm. the, other, the other girl, we play the scene on the other girls hearing mm -hmm. the sounds. So yep. we kind of, we know what's happening to her and we're horrified, but we're not having to watch anything that's, that's gratuitous. And it was very important to me not to make a gratuitous movie, which, which and that was one of the big audience um, comments when I was researching films about sex trafficking of previous films that have been done. A lot of them were like, you know, worthy subject matter, but I just couldn't watch it. So we had to be very careful with all of that. And, and I think, you know, I'm, I think that was the kind of right choice and an important one. And, um, you know, we want, we, want, we want it to be seen by teenagers and families. We have been making um, NGOs aware of it. We just recently, I did a screening of, we were going to do the feature, but they wanted something shorter in length. So we ended up doing the short for the whole of the Long Beach School District in collaboration with um, uh, the Long Beach Human Trafficking Task Force, who are an amazing group. So um, what we did, we did a kind of like a month social media campaign with like trafficking awareness stuff, like in conjunction with the school and the kids. And then all the kids saw the film prior to the event with their teachers and discussed it and came up with questions. And then we had a panel with like me and a couple of the actors. And then we had another panel with a survivor, a detective, wow. somebody from an NGO, et cetera, which was, which was very powerful. 
And I think that was a kind of huge success. So we're now going to be talking to them about doing something with the feature. We may break it up into like little pieces so it fits into the time slot better. Um, but I've also have an educational presentation prepared so it can be used in kind of classrooms and, you know, with kind of like questions and answers mm -hmm. for the teachers to go through with the kids. Really um, smart. Which I, think is I mean, important. yeah, very important. I mean, there's so many, you know, Olivia, I think, said it earlier. I mean, you're just unaware that this, you know, so many parents are unaware of being in the room with the families and mothers not realizing that this this could happen. Um, Julia, talk about Artists for Change. Mm. So Art, Artists for Change is a, 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 a nonprofit that I founded. And the goal of the nonprofit um, is to create media that raises awareness on key social issues. So for right now, we've been focused on child trafficking and uh, it's it's been very successful. And we've also we also made a little promo for another nonprofit that actually works on trafficking to highlight the work that they do. Because I, I believe that film can be so powerful in, in raising awareness for things. And so what a few years ago, I was asked to, after doing the short, I was asked to speak at a conference for a group of nonprofits from all over the world about um, Lost Girls, the short film that I'd made on trafficking and how they could do something similar for whatever issue they were dealing with, whether it be agriculture or team bullying or whatever. And then in talking to everybody afterwards, I realized that a lot of these nonprofits didn't have anyone there with any um, narrative storytelling skills. And they also didn't have any budget to media to kind of create anything because a lot of the grants and a lot of the funding that they they were given had to be used for providing services so i saw you know that was something that that could be a real help so we could help like multiple ngos yeah. by creating content that could then be used for education because to me from all the research i've done the 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 the, the way to put a stop on this is to educate because it's a very long and difficult process to rehabilitate survivors. But if we can stop it from happening by educating teenagers, families, teachers, people mm -hmm. working with, with youth as to what the signs of someone being trafficked look like, um, the techniques the traffickers are using to recruit teenagers, you know, even other teenagers spotting something going on with one of their friends, if they can be encouraged to learn to recognize it and report it to someone in authority, that teenager can be saved. And so I think, you know, get really getting more education on this in schools. I also think with young boys nowadays for a lot of a lot of teenagers, their sex education is through porn films. And so that's how, what they learn is, is appropriate ways to treat women. And they think that's how women like to be treated. So if young boys um, can understand what trafficking looks like, you know, we, may, we also may be helping to stop, create future buyers of, 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 um, child, you know, of, of children which I That's think is important too. It, that is point. really a great point. And I, I can't even imagine what um, how social media has added to this horror of trafficking because, you know, um, I think that, you know, people can hide behind social media trying to get the attention of young people. Um, you yeah, yeah they, they actually can. And you're, you're absolutely right, Alan, unfortunately. During the pandemic, you would think that numbers have gone down, but actually the numbers are going up. You know, I've, I've been on a number of calls recently, and, and one of the big concerns is right now is that, you know, these traffickers are, are really t targeting teenagers through social media, through video game chat, uh, chat rooms, etc. And, uh, and, a lot of these kids are playing video games and they're getting approaches. A woman was saying, 
yesterday that a, that a mother had, had reached out to her and said her, her child had, had been approached to, by someone in Japan wanting to mm-hmm. wanting him to come out there and, and work for them as a video game player. Now that could have been genuine or it could have been a trap. And luckily, he told his parent. Um, so I think it's very important for parents to really work on building trust with their children. So if they are approached online by anything that seems a little odd, they let the parents know. And also encourage not to go meet with anyone without letting you know somebody know or going on their own and not taking anyone. They should always take somebody with them. Um, because this, mm. this is a this is a this is this is a huge problem, and 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 even kind of, to a certain extent, monitoring your 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 child's internet activity. So if you see something that that doesn't look right, you know, call the police and have them investigate it. Yeah, it's Always interesting. Better. The reason I had mentioned social media is I I can't recall the the story, but it is recent of a young person being sold drugs through Snapchat and he was sold fentanyl and ended up dying from it. But it was, you know, social media, you know, it was somebody they didn't know and they bought drugs from somebody. It was on the news. But what um, somebody watching Danielle says, why isn't sex trafficking uh, covered more on the news? Uh, that's a very good question, Danielle, and and something that we that we that we have to change um, because it should be covered. You know, we we I, and that's why you know I I, I what I hope mm-hmm. is that my film will start to get people to to really talk about this and start asking exactly those type of questions. Why isn't it being covered more on the on the news? Why do why are we not having a major push at sort of education about this issue and why are there not kind of higher penalties for um, people purchasing um, ch- children for sex? I no. mean, public service announcements, Any, I mean, something. Well, I, I have a few thoughts on that. And one is, um, you know, there is a genre of film made that is known in the industry as women in peril. And so women in peril have been turned into um, a narrative that can be sold for consumption. And what is so important about the time that we're in now is that women and men are coming together collectively to say, we are changing this narrative. This narrative is no longer acceptable to us as people of ethics and dignity. Uh, We need to create new narratives where we're showing what are the results of dehumanization uh, and what are the values that we stand by um, as human beings that uplift and uh, bring us together and uh, where we are proud of who we are as people. Um, one of the beautiful things in Julia's film is is the family, the power of the family coming together mm-hmm. to, to, to not reject their child after they've been through this horrific experience, um, but to embrace them, to not fear the things that have happened to her but to love her through it. And I just think that is so beautiful and important. And, and I, I, I see it happening. I see the evolution in our industry happening. Um, but I always want to put out another word for it and, and to say, you know, kudos to Julia for starting Artists for Change. I love that she created this organization. I love the, the heart and the focus um, uh, towards these uh, these values um, and this new narrative behind that organization. Well, Olivia and Katie, you know, you both, I mean, all three of you are artists, but you both started as young actresses. Do you have experiences that, you know, frightened you at some point during your careers? Do you have a few years? <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, sorry. <laughs> I didn't say for myself, of course, I've had so many experiences all over this area, uh, including being a child, uh, going in on an audition and experiencing physical, inappropriate touching, grabbing, pulling, kissing, all of that at under, I was 15 years old. And having to figure out how do I get out of this alive? How do I get out of this room? And it was, I mean, it's still to this day is something that I, I struggle with the feelings of, of that, the, the helplessness, the vulnerability, um, the confusion as to why anyone would want to do that to me. Um, uh, and the, the anger and, and the hopelessness. It, it, it was so disheartening um, that I'm coming in with my, my courage at that young age and trying to make something happen and um, for myself as an artist and creative person and to be met with such salacious behavior. Um, and Taking I'm- Taking advantage. I mean, mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, you crazy. know, it's one thing I always said every time I got a soap job, it's like, I will not do a rape scene. It won't happen. It's not happening. We're not doing it. <laughs> I will quit <laughs> because I don't feel that for me, for me, I couldn't a handle it. But uh, but also because it wasn't it, rarely have those scenes been treated with the kind of consideration of the overall arc that Julia has treated this situation. It, it was interesting because I was trying to think of that when Julia was speaking earlier and we were talking about uh the actress playing Angie. And I was wondering if any of the characters you had portrayed had ever been through something as traumatizing as rape or, you know, something like that. But um, yeah, Dixie was abducted by Billy Clyde and he tied me up and he held a knife to my neck and it was all the threat of, and that happened. There was another threat of, but those things would send me into such total like triggered despair. Um, I would oftentimes get sick or uh, like really, really physically sick after them. Um, uh, and also I just, it was so hard. It was hard for me. I wasn't able to do what Jane did or the other girls so, so courageously, which is to be a channel and then, you know, go home and, and be okay. You know, it, it, that I wasn't able to do that. I think it was too close to home for me for other things. And so, um, uh, but it, 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 it's, it, it's not easy for anybody, even if you don't have, you know, some sort of pre-existing child abuse, you know? Right, but it, you know, it's interesting though, you talk about the girls though, it's today where I think because we are having these conversations, they may be stronger than we were back when you were 15 and, and this was happening, or, you, you know, when you were, you know, do, you know, tied up by Billy Clyde is a different period in our, mm -hmm. in our country than it is today and how we're talking about these things, whether it's sex trafficking or the Me Too movement or any of that, we're, we're having these conversations, which is the most important thing we can do to make change, I believe, in everything. Absolutely. I mean, to be able to have this conversation openly, uh, lovingly, um, to be able to watch a film like Julia's with your family or with your school or with your organization and to have a conversation about it to broach these sort of these things that we're all, we always used to push away or, you know, or turn into some sort of crazy, it's happening on Mars situation. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's children being abducted on another planet. Let's go <laughs> save them. You know, <laughs> uh, it's, it's just, it's a, it's a, it's a sign of the, of the courage and also the need, you know, there's a great need uh, for us to start confronting this and and I think the desire for us to be better people and to want to make a better world for ourselves and for each other. Absolutely. And Olivia, for yourself, did you have similar experiences? Um, you know, not not in the, the work environment. Luckily, I, I I I mean, I did my first film when I was fourteen, but my mom uh, was always very protective of me and she was a real mama bear and there was no way that anyone was going to mess with me her dukes um, were up <laughs> yeah yeah um 
you know, however, being, you know, a, a, a young teen in Los Angeles, um, I did get, you know, I was never approached by anybody in the business. I, I did, um, my, you know, I, when my parents got divorced, just, just to give you, you know, um, uh, an idea of how this correlates with, uh, you know, the, the vulnerabilities that these young children face. You know, if you if you're coming out of a situation or you're in the process of having parents getting divorced, you're incredibly vulnerable. So I was. Um, my father got remarried and, and, and moved to England. So my mother was a single mother and she was trying to, um, you know, juggle being a mother and a father. And I think uh, it's an incredibly difficult job. And, and she did overall an amazing job. But I think... Um, you know, uh, I th th there was a couple of uh, of occasions that got a little bit a uh, little a little bit um, tricky uh, for me. And luckily, I had people around me that that aside from my mother, you know, a a a, 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 a young man who was a few years older than me that subsequently then became my boyfriend because he actually protected me from. I got dr I got drugged basically. I got given a roofie. Um, uh, in my wine, which I'd only just, I really didn't drink much, but a, a man asked me at an after party of something if I wanted a glass of, you know, something to drink. And the next thing I knew, I was, I was, I woke up um, with, you know, a group of men around me. And um, to make a long story short, um, those kind of things still happen you know so i was at nothing bad happened um uh but I, I i got saved i got saved by somebody who was with me that evening but you know it, it, it got pretty scary because there are there are good people we have to remember but i think um what was really important too that you shared and i'm glad you did is uh, you know there are lots of single moms out there oh, yeah. raising young women and to, just to hear that they are in a vulnerable state because just just like you said about the character Haley and and your husband in the movie were working parents a yes. single mom I'm sure is working even more so to to you know provide for her family which I'm sure makes a a child much more vulnerable at that that moment absolutely uh, and I think you know I think it's why uh you know, women who are faced with this kind of thing, you know, it's, 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 it, it, it's traumatic when they, when they're put in situations where they would, would find out that their child had been sort of taken into by a traffic ringleader, you know, it's, uh, there's a lot of really strong, my heart and my, and I, it's kudos to all of these single mothers out there who are, mm -hmm. you know, dealing with these situations and raising children but overall doing a really amazing job you know absolutely katie and julia will you work together again <laughs> oh i hope so I, <laughs> I think she's just the best i sincerely hope so too and i also <laughs> hope to work with olivia again too well i yeah i know you've got ladies have been friends a long time katie um acting directing producing you just finished jennifer on days What's your preference these days? If if you could, you know, choose the next 10 years. Um, I would probably say uh, directing um, because you really get to have your hands in everything in terms of the vision of something and the ability to work one-on-one -on -one with the talent on the set. I mean, Julia, you know, like it is just so great to have that one-to-one -one with with the actors and be there for their performances and be able to have that voice to help craft those performances. Uh, and um, as an actor, you know, well, you come from a special, yeah. you come from a special place in that, you know, I did a show recently with Francesca James uh, and, you know, she was talking about going from acting to, you know, you, you have that added experience that just, I think probably makes you a better, you know, actor's director. For sure. I have both the uh, empathy for what they're going through, but also the understanding of the craft. So I can say to them, like, the light is here. 
I want you to look your best. And so trust me, <laughs> I know how you're going to feel if I don't tell you where the light is. You know, so, you know, I we bet. can have some good laughs about that. Yeah. But producing right. for projects like this is is always a great pleasure because I know that it's going to make a difference in the world. And and I do love being a part of things that help help change the world for the better. For sure. And yeah, acting sure. is always fun. Acting is like eating candy, you know? You're like, ooh, <laughs> what do we do? What was, what was it like doing a show like days during COVID? What was it an I, interesting? It was just a blessing out of, you know, it was a great reason to I could get out of the house. I could go, you know, do a job. Of course, there's all the like, how many gloves do I wear? How many masks? You know, how many get out of your sweatpants, swab the nose. Yeah. Forced me to exercise and take care of myself and, you know, really put my best face forward. And, uh, and it was really, I mean, I, my first day was so heavenly. I just laughed and laughed and it was such a great, goofy, wonderful, fun experience. I, I just had a blast. Oh, that's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. Olivia, like Katie, you, your hand, hands are in, you know, in front of the camera acting and then just, your voice, which I was shocked. I actually did not realize you have voiced so many characters. Do yes. you have a preference being in front or using your voice? Well, I, I, funnily, I think being a musician and singing and um, writing songs and, and having a career as a voiceover actress, uh, you know, in animation uh, makes you a better actor. Uh, because it, mm. you know, you your voice is your instrument, and it's it's very much can be really uh, such a huge part of of creating a character. And I think when you're um, given the opportunity to um, create a character solely with your voice, uh, it 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 you and bring it to life and bring it to life to the point where animators get sort of galvanized and stimulated to you know bring in your posture and your body language. Uh, that's a really cool thing. I, I, it, it's all just, I just love being an artist, period, you know, whether it's acting in front of the camera, you know, I've just got offered a feature to direct, which is very exciting. Um, awesome. Congrats. So, can you talk, um, can you talk about it? Um, not quite yet. Cause okay. it's, it's really at the, at the, the very beginnings, but, uh, but it's a, um, but it's a, a, a thriller. Uh, and, uh, uh, and it's got a mystical, mystical quality to it. So, um, you know, I, I've, um, you know, I, I teach a master class uh, with, at the Meisner at John Ruskin um, uh, um, School of Acting, and, and I've been working with actors in scenes. And I just love working with actors. I love, like Caddy said, and as Julia knows, speaking the language. It's a um, it, it, for me, it's a spiritual experience, and I've loved being involved in Artists for Change and making things. I think you just come to that crossroads and not as an artist where that's the next, that's the next frontier, that's the next step that you want to make, is you want to take all of the knowledge and the experience that you have, um, and you want to immerse yourself and really... Um, help others find their voice and help guide them, you know, to almost be a spirit guide, if you will, or a, you know, a river guide. Um, and then, and, and then music. I mean, I've, I'm always writing music, whether it's scoring stuff for a film or writing music for a film. Um, yeah, I just. And you play guitar and piano? Yes. That's incredible. I always think anybody who can play piano can walk into a room and just change the entire <laughs> mood, mood of yeah, any. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean, I've just been. I, it's my favorite favorite uh, part of being a musician is going to a party and you're going, you know, have people just sit down and we just decide what we're going to play. And it's like, well, I, yeah, I think I know Open Arms by Journey. So <laughs> give it a whirl. And, uh, oh my God, know, that would be the best thing ever. Yeah, it's just like, okay, let's cover the 80s. Let's cover the 90s, let's the 70s. Take a decade. I'll see what I can do, you know. And, and what's it like being a voice in the, you know, Star Wars, in Star Wars and start, you know, the, the sci-fi world? Was that new to you? And because I know what the fandom there is. I mean, is it just, 
incredible. Yeah, it's 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 wonderfully nerdy and and <laughs> some of the smartest people that I've ever met. I mean, I'm luckily part of the Dirty Dozen, which is a um, means you've done Star Trek and Star Wars, and there's about twelve actors who've sort of done both. And so, but it is science fiction. It's like the science fiction world. So, um, Dirty I, Dozen. I never. I love that. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good name. Um, uh, and so, um, yeah, playing a Jedi, playing Luminara, um, having, you know, got to work on um, the last film, um, Rise and Fall of, of Skywalker, um, was was really amazing. And just I was in incredible company there. And um, it was, uh, it's great to play a Jedi. It's been great to play a Q, omnipotent characters. I, I like playing supernatural um kind of omnipotent characters those are always the best to play you know because it's uh well they're just so empowering and and, and powerful and fun that's fantastic that's so great julia what's next for the film so um it's it's out there um people can see it on on amazon direct tv itunes lots of places and um, next up, you know, we want to get it in. We're get focusing on get trying to get it in schools, colleges. We're going to be doing more educational screenings with it, and just want everyone to spread the word. And I, you know, I think, I think we... colleges and and high school education, it is really a great tool for that. Yeah, and I think if we if we can just. You know, if, if everybody uses their voice to say no more trafficking, like time's up on trafficking, then change will be change will be possible because, you know, we've made a like little tool here. So we just need to get momentum behind it and, and people watching it and, and using their voices to speak out because the reality is those girls that are trafficked and, and currently there are like – loads thousands of teenagers that are trafficked and being held against their will they don't have a voice to speak out so we've got to do it for them and well, everybody I know everybody who's watching it please go and watch the movie and share share it on social media so we are spreading the word and spreading the conversation Mm. And if you're an educator, I mean, please uh, consider using the film and reaching out to Julia and Artists for Change to come and speak uh, to your to your school. They, they go to artistsforchange.org to, to mm -hmm. reach you, right, Julia? Yeah. yeah. Great. Yeah. That's I mean, really as you smart. can tell, Julia is a fantastic speaker and very well um, informed on the subject. Uh, and you know, it really is a, a beautiful thing to sit in a room. I've done it myself uh, and, and watch uh, everyone become, you know, watch their mind shift, watch their awareness change. Uh, it's, it's been, as Julie can speak to, you know, it's very powerful to, to watch younger people, college age kids, high school kids to become aware of this and, um, and, and feel empowered to, to do something about it. And well, it must really awaken them completely, but also, you know, I think it's so important what Olivia said. I mean, parents who don't realize that's, you know, to protect their children, you know, to not yeah. realize that this is so prevalent and can happen. Yeah. And it's a great opportunity for, for parents to sit with their kids and watch this and have a have that difficult conversation. So as we go back out into the world, as we're all planning to hopefully very soon, um, you know, we're, we're going out there wise uh, empowered with information, knowing that we can do something about it and, um, and have those tools uh, to be able to uh, protect ourselves and others. Is there anything we missed, Julia? No, I think, I think I'm just, you know, I think, I think we all feel so grateful, um, Alan, and, and, and really thank you for having all of us on our show. It's and my pleasure. It's a really important subject. And, and I, I'm glad I got to see the movie, you know, to be able to have this conversation. And just ask everyone to spread the word. The film's available to be screened in schools, colleges, for education. 
and and watch it with your teenagers build trust like talk to them about it and because in in many ways you know teenagers keeping an eye out for each other that can be incredibly powerful too and and we've had like a number of teenagers that have seen their film talk to schools about trying to get like a, their whole school to do a screening so their other friends can see it yeah that's great the link is also on the youtube you know, so anybody watching it, it is uh, in the description underneath, so you can find it to find out where you can watch it. But just like Julia said, it's pretty much available everywhere. Thank you, ladies, so much for being here. Really great to see you all. Meet you, Julia and Olivia. Lovely to meet you. Thank um, have you so much. have, have you a wonderful weekend, Katie. Say hello to your husband for me. <laughs> I, I will. I will. Okay. <laughs> Bye, Thank everybody. You. Thank you. You're Bye. so welcome, Julia. Bye. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thanks so much. Again, check out Angie Lost Girls and uh, share it with folks you know. If you haven't subscribed to my YouTube channel, you can do so below. Turn on the notifications and have a great weekend, everybody. See you next week. <laughs>